Mark, I was just delighted to get to look deeper into your life and your education and your professional stories. So we want to talk about um, this particular epic piece called The Hope Suite. What would you like me to know, just as a new, sort of a new uh, appreciator of that work? Well, the core of that work has to do with its theme of hope. And that came to be in 2008, when there was a presidential election in this country, and I realized that I was feeling hopeful. And I realized that I hadn't felt that way in some time. And that inspired me to do something. And when artists get inspired about something going on in the world, we usually do something about it and make art about it. And I thought, what could I do? And I thought, well, this is the 44th president. Why don't I make 44 works? So that's where the 44 came from. And the theme of hope was really not due to any campaign or anything of anybody, any uh, candidate. It was about my hope because I really felt hopeful. And I, it surprised me that it had been so long before I had felt that way. What's this feeling? Oh, it's hope. So that was the theme of the whole series. And it took me six years to uh, complete it because I took time with each single one. But as I was working on these works, it became about something much bigger than that. It, it became about not any particular president, not even any particular country. Okay. It became global and a way to connect everybody with everybody else. And that's really the theme of this hope, is bringing all these different cultures together through these 44 words okay. for hope. Yeah, that's the theme. And it, as I understand it, there's there are 44 cultures and languages that you are drawing together. That's exactly right. And in all fairness, uh, some of the words are not from a linguistic language from a particular culture. It, they are things like uh, Morse code or binary code or a wave graph of me saying the word hope. So those things are mixed in. There are five or six or seven of those. The rest of them are all languages from different cultures. Okay. Yeah. So it's a mix. Tell me about one of these images. Let's enter it. Give me one. Well, I'll tell you that. Uh, there are two answers to that question. Okay. One is the, the English one, because I naturally started with the word hope in English. So that is still one of my favorites and one of the best, I think, in the series. However, when I decided what language am I going to do next, I thought, well, the point of this is to build bridges between cultures. What are some of the cultures we really would most love to build bridges to? What language do they speak? And it immediately became very clear that that was Arabic. So I thought, I got to do Arabic as the next one, the second one. So I did. And then the Arabic one became, in some sense, one of my very favorite from all 44. It's visually, artistically, aesthetically, I think, one of the most beautiful of the whole set. I'll say this about it, and this is true of all of them, in the sense that they are essentially collages. And there is a background behind each collage. Most of those backgrounds are what we call in the art world a monotype. It's a type of printmaking. So there's only one that comes out of a painting you do, basically, a mash some paper on a painting, and you get a monotype in the background. So almost all of these have a monotype in the background, usually done on a printing press, sometimes by hand. And then on top of that is a collage of all kinds of things because I am a mixed media collagist. I use collages, uh, I use material from all over the place, a lot like Rauschenberg did, who inspired me. And so then I do, I draw things into it, I paint things into it, and I put that word into it by hand. And there is a special draw for you about the Arabic um, right. um, language and approach and dialogue right. with our cultural understanding. Tell That's, me more about that. Well, that comes from the, the feeling that in this world in which we live now, politically, one of the cultures that we need to work the hardest at getting along with is the Arabic world. And so that's why that, that language is so important to me. But 
another aspect of it, which became true of every single one of these 44, is what does that word look like visually? Forget about what the word is, the meaning of the word, the culture it comes from. Look at the visual aspect of that word. Turn it upside down. See what it looks like. The Arabic is so gorgeous as a culture that I just completely fell in love with it. I'd love to learn all of Arabic because it's beautiful. In fact, most of the Mideastern languages are gorgeous, like a lot of the Eastern languages. And for you, there's a visual aspect to these words. Absolutely. Words are extremely important to me. I kind of grew up around words in a religious environment. And words were so important to life and faith and theology and philosophy. And also, I have writers in my family, and I've always been a writer. What style of art is it? I would call it mixed media uh, and uh, collage. Uh, I would call it modernism. It really is kind of classic modernism. Yeah. Hey, how did you pick, you know... There's a lot of cultures and languages, and you and you said, no, nope, I'm limiting this to 44. How did That's you right. choose? That's a good question, and it was not always easy because I would go online and I would look at various languages. First of all, I started with some of the basics. I thought, well, I, I want to do Arabic next. I want to do Spanish. I want to do French, uh, German, Gaelic. Or if I had some reason, at the time I was married to a woman that came out of a Czech background, I thought, well, I got to do Czech, so I did Czech. So it really kind of depended on what I was interested in, what I liked, maybe a particular culture. I, I had to do uh, Italian, you know, I love to hear that language. And so a lot of it was very personal. I would think, well, this is cool. Or I thought, I love the Inuit culture up there in Alaska and in, in the north of uh the Arctic, and I thought, well, I got to do Inuit, you know. And some of them, frankly, were just funny. Like I would see this word, up, up, oop, for hope, and I would think, well, I got to use that. <laughs> so some of them made me laugh, actually. <laughs> so let's talk about the process a little bit. All right. I would do about 10 or a dozen at a time, and that would just be the background. That would be the monotype with a little bit of painting or drawing. So to create some color, some texture that I thought was interesting, basically an abstract expressionist background painting. And once I got a dozen or so of those, I would lay them out and ask myself, hmm, what particular country might work here? Like there was one that was a photograph that was mostly this beautiful green color of a, the front of a porch at Flatbed Press. And I looked at that and I thought, Hawaii, that's got to be Hawaiian. That's so beautiful. And so the green said, I, I want to be Hawaii, you know. And then I saw another one that was a photograph I had taken that had to do with an acid bath that would kind of made its own painting. And I looked at that and it had a kind of a seriousness about it. And I thought, well, that's got to be Germany. So I would pick out the ones that I thought fit a particular culture. And then I would put that word in there. That would be the German word for hope. So all of them were done that way. They all have some reason why the background made me think of that particular culture. As one looks at the word from a particular culture, and then you look around at the items that are glued in there as part of the collage, you will find that a lot of those items don't seem to have anything to do with that culture at all. And that's one thing that I wanted. I did not want to have, for the Greek one, a whole bunch of pictures of Greek architecture and sculpture. I wanted to have all kinds of things in there. And again, another way of bringing in the whole world and being inclusive. So a lot of the things that are collaged in there don't really have a rational connection to the theme of that particular piece. And pointedly, I wanted to make sure I brought in things that were 90 degrees from whatever you thought it was. So then you could kind of make up your own interpretation of why would that be there? In most cases, it was purely visual for me. It was a color, it was a texture, it was some reason I liked it there. And when I made these, by the way, I would let them seep for a long time, each one of them, sometimes for weeks and months. And, he, and they would tell me they wanted a little change and I would make a little change. 
And then I'd come back to them later and they'd say, I want one more little change. And also I want you to take some of the stuff out and make it simpler. So I would let them tell me how they wanted to be finished. And then finally I would glue it all down. So does it have a sequence of any kind? Is there a narrative idea about seeing all these? That's a good question. And the answer is... Order in which they should be seen? A good question. The answer is no. Uh, it is random. Uh, I... However, visually, I have groupings that I like better than others, but that has to do with color, it has to do with texture, mostly color. So I plan them out in groups that I like visually, but otherwise it's a random order. And when you look at the quilt of all 44, all tiled together, that is pretty random with a couple of exceptions where I place certain things. But mostly it really, I've, I've wondered what order should they be in? And I realized, you know, it really doesn't matter. Yeah. All the orders work. <laughs> I want to listen to you talk about your inspiration on this. Marcel Duchamp has always inspired me by something he said when he said, I want to bring art back to the life of the mind. And he did. Because now when you look at contemporary art and what's going on in it, most of it is about what's going on in the mind. You mentioned Rauschenberg. And I know his work has been a great influence to you. Uh, uh, I, the, you know, some of the things I know about him, uh, he was a New Yorker, hung out with Warhol, right? That's and, right. He was, he was from Texas, Port Arthur. So he's an old Texas boy Okay. Uh, that wound up in New York. And That's he right. combined elements a lot. He was a sculptor and a painter. And he was. He brought it all together in a new way. And he was a very initially inspired by Marcel Duchamp okay. and by Dadaism. Yeah. And of course, he and Jasper Johns were, were evolving uh, as young artists at about the same time. And they both had to do with that Dadaism, but went into a whole different kind of art that was completely different from the abstract expressionism that was the big deal at the time. And they blew it into populism basically in a really wonderful way. So that was part of what Rauschenberg did. And he is very important to me as an artist. Uh, when I was an undergraduate and I first saw his work, I immediately fell in love with his work and felt like, my goodness, that's the that's the work I want to do. That's my work. I'm him. He's me. It, it felt that strongly, even as an undergraduate. How does his uh, imagination slip into yours? Well, it happened early on, especially when I started writing my dissertation about him and his, his prints, because I realized that we had both grown up in a very similar kind of culture in Texas. It was, we were both members of a religious group that is very exclusivistic, so that uh, everybody's kind of in a box and we're all in the same box. It was very tight. And we both kind of broke out of the box. And when we did, we both became inclusivists. And that was one of the reasons I think he kept inspiring me because he was so global in the way that he did his work. So if I understand it, um, an exclusivist is someone with a worldview that says that only only the people that think and see it like I do are uh, um, are uh, blessed and acceptable. That's correct. An inclusivist is somebody that would include lots and lots of other points. That's of view right. That's and right. Welcome them into a more of a dialogical and a relational. Right. That's exactly right. And that's, that's what inspired exactly. you. That was a big part of it. Yes. Would, now, did he, uh, in addition to the work itself, did, was his thinking on that uh, influential for you? Oh, yes, very much so. And this series was partially inspired by a series he did that he called Rocky, uh, Rauschenberg Overseas Cultural Interchange. And he went all over the world uh, with his own money working with artists in all these different countries in order to create art that related somehow to their art as well as to his. And then in the end, I got to see an exhibition of all the, that art that was done in the Rocky program at, in Washington, D.C. And what that did was bring the whole world together. 
in a wonderful way. And so that is part of the reason I did this, was to try to build bridges between cultures in the way that he built bridges between cultures with his Rocky program. What is it? What exactly is a Hope Suite? The Hope Suite is, for me, I hope, a way of allowing people to slowly look at something and be inspired to include the whole world in the way that they think about people. Okay, so someone's going to want to connect with you on 44 works. Right. How do they even begin? Well, I think the way I want them to begin is the beauty of the piece. For me, the beauty factor is very important. So I want each of these 44 to be gorgeous in some way. So I, that's the gateway that I want people to enter, to see that and go, wow, that is wonderful to look at. And then after they get through the gate, they can ask themselves, what is this about? There's this over here and that over there and all this different stuff. And there's a word there I can't even read. So then they get into it and they start doing are moving toward doing what is so important to me in terms of any art, and that is to finish it. Because there, it's a tripod. There's me, the artist. There's the work of art, but then it's not finished until you, as the viewer, comes in and you finish it your way. So every single viewer finishes every single work of art. So I want to bring you into it so that you can do that. I don't want to finish it up so well that there's nothing for you to do. <laughs> they may say, well, wow, my great grandfather was Icelandic and here's the Icelandic word for hope. And so it, it, somewhere you find a way to get in there. It may be Gaelic because you're Scotch-Irish, you know, it may be Spanish. Somewhere there's a, there's a gateway for you and your family and your history. You may be an immigrant and you find, oh, wow, there's the Chinese for hope. And that has even happened in this studio where a Chinese woman comes in and I, I say, did I do it right on the Chinese word for hope? And she says, yeah, it's pretty much right. And she said, I'll even, I'll make some for you. And so she takes the sumi brush and makes the word hope for me. That happened right here in the studio. So I love it when things like that do happen. It's happened with the, with the Russian uh, and other languages that people have sort of made sure it was correct. One of the reasons I wanted to get this on the wall and I think one of the reasons that I've discovered interest in putting it on the wall in several other places, other museums and so forth, is that it does invite people to think about what their own hopes are. And so one of the things that's gonna happen in the exhibition is it will be interactive in that one can sit down and write one's own hope and say, I hope X. And then that card will go into a bowl of hope. So we will have a lot of hopes right in the center of this whole exhibition that anyone and everyone that comes in there and sees it can think about what is my hope for me, for my family, for my friends, for the world. And they can write that down and we'll have a bowl of hope. Yes, it just keeps getting broader and broader and broader. And I have been inspired by the fact that it has, it has grown legs. It may start going lots of places because every place needs hope, every person needs hope. And it, it's, I think the timing for it just turned out to be appropriate. I didn't plan it that way, but in the six years and beyond, it has become more and more important to try to bring a little hope into the world. And that's just one way I can do it. I can't do it as a politician. I can't do it you know, in other ways, but I can do it as an artist. So it's a, it's a small thing, but I really believe that these small things, when we're all doing small things, can change the world. <laughs>